Now, first up, we are joined by John Story, Director of the Legal Rights Program for the Institute of Public Affairs. John, welcome to Spectator TV. Thanks, Alexandra. Great to be on the show. We are nearly in the final week of the campaign for the Voice to Parliament referendum. How do you feel that both sides have done when it comes to getting their message across? Well, the, the polling would tell you that the yes case um, has done a disastrous job and the no case um, has, has done uh, very well. Uh, there's been various attempts um, to, to, to change course. Um, uh, I don't think um, any of that has, has really worked. We're, we're still very much seeing a campaign run on the vibe based on emotion. And when you have a campaign based on emotion, you get angry at the other side. Um, and that has been um, the, the theme of the campaign from, from the yes case. And if the polls are any indication, it has not worked. Well, you're so right. With the exception of Jacinta Price and Warren Mundine, personally, I think the Yes Camp has actually done all the heavy lifting for the No Case by simply revealing the true nature of the activist industry. The, we've had racist comments and disturbing ideology coming out of their headline speakers, and that has appalled Australians. Not only that, but the idea that a group of people believe themselves to be spiritually superior I think that shocked the general public that that, that sentiment is sitting there. Now, you know, do you think that the Yes Camp, their biggest asset, has they've been the biggest asset to No Cause? Because I'm sure that the No Cause has done so much better every time you've got someone walk out there. It's really lifted the polls for the No Cause. Oh, look, Jacinta Price has been a, a fantastic asset for the No Case. So I, I don't want to diminish her role in this and, and Warren Mundine. Um, as well, who have done a fantastic job. But I couldn't agree with you more. The best thing the no case could do and has has probably been uh, the plan for a while is to just say nothing, do nothing and let the yes case talk because they have consistently made the case for the no case, whether it's just using the words of these activists who have talked in the past or during this campaign about um, treaties and reparations and paying the rent um, their quick temper in the sense that um, they're very quick to label their opponents as, as racists or, 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 or bigots. Um, it's, it's just really, the, I don't want to diminish anyone on the no case. I'm sure there's been people working really well, but I think the yes case has done the job for them. Oh, not only that, Jacinta Price has been an awful lot of fun. Were you entertained by her press club conference when she managed to own a whole lot of left-wing journalists? Because, quite frankly, conservative media has been devoid of that kind of wonderful spirit we're seeing come out of Jacinta. Yeah, oh, I mean, she's she's fantastic. I'm I'm well and truly hitching myself to the the Jacinta bandwagon. Um, one of the things that came out of that speech, it's something um, just taking a step back, is that it used to be that sort of conservatives were seen as the stuffy, boring, fuddy-duddy types and, and the left were the rock stars and the people having fun. That has completely flipped. The left are humourless. You can't make jokes because you might offend people. Whereas it, it was clear that Jacinta can work a room and get people laughing and actually um, enjoying it. And I think that's a real positive message that being a conservative isn't, you know, putting your hand up and, and saying no to progress. It's actually a vision of freedom, being itself, expressing yourself. And that just came through with Jacinta. She, she got the, a room full of lefty journalists laughing. Yes, yeah, she had a lot of mic drop moments which were so satisfying to watch, but what she also did was expose how fragile some of this ideology is the second somebody challenges it. Now, the Voice to Parliament referendum has seen the disturbing weaponization of history and the demonization of people's ancestors. Now, how toxic is this new breed of black activism? And I mean the Marxist BLAK ideology, which is a very specific ideology we've seen grow up, that tells people that your ancestors are terrible and you have nothing to be proud of and you are guilty of their sins and therefore the state is going to punish you in particular in perpetuity. Surely this is not the kind of thing that we want to see emerge in Australia because it is going to make people upset if you keep talking about people's ancestors this way. 
the, the revelation of that type of thinking has been what's instrumental in this referendum campaign. Uh, you, you and I are pretty engaged in politics and we follow it mostly uh, closely. Most people don't. And when most people think of, uh, of, of um, racism, they think of treating people differently and they think of equality as we're all the same. And the revelation to a lot of people is that is not what the people who are arguing for this argue. They think that, well, to be a fair society, you have to treat different people differently. Um, this person has, is, a, is an oppressor, so they, 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 you know, they need to atone for what they've done. Um, this person is a, in a, an oppressed victim category, so therefore they have special rights. And most people who aren't, you know, this has not been recent if you've been you know, observing the left for a while, but the casual observer is suddenly going, so what? We, we've got to give special rights for someone to achieve equality. They don't realise that the left flipped from the sort of Martin Luther King, you know, judge me by the content of my character, not the colour of my skin, to this system of, well, everyone should be divided into their, their victim hierarchy and allocated rights on, on that basis. It's an absolutely toxic um, uh, uh, development if we did go down that path. Hopefully, uh, if, if the referendum um, fails, um, that might be a bit of a course correct on, on this issue. But you just cannot have a society where everyone needs to either atone or have rights based on what happened to their ancestors hundreds of years ago. It feels like this has happened overnight, but really that has been the left-wing narrative for a long time. I, I consider it more like you've got a, a nest of termites somewhere and suddenly you see the wall is starting to buckle and you, uh, you chip in and realise that there's been a problem there for a really long time. And this referendum is exposing a lot of problems with left-wing ideology that I don't think mainstream Australia has been paying a particularly large amount of attention to at election time, perhaps they should have been. But there has been a dishonesty in Labor's voice to Parliament proposition because we seem to be having two completely different conversations. Yes, campaigners say this is just a recognition, this is just being kind, Aboriginal people just want a voice, while the No campaign points out that no, this is not recognition or advice, it is a race-based bureaucracy backed by the power of the High Court to interfere with and override democratic processes, effectively dismantling the concept of democracy and replacing it with a union-style bargaining arrangement between races, which doesn't sound like a great idea. Now, how do we end up with the yes camp and the no camp arguing completely different realities? Well, the central, um, the, re the reason that's come about is the conflation of two concepts of which the proponents of this referendum have done. They've conflated the concept of Indigenous recognition in the Constitution, which has various, you know, um, uh, things going for it, various issues, but has generally had pretty bipartisan support, at least at the political level. And they've conflated that with this idea of a voice, which is a body with the with the power to make representations not just to parliament to the executive government and because it's enshrined in the constitution that may give it various rights to 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 enforce the government to be able to listen to them and consult with them and hold up things if they are not consulted so it's got you know it's got a little bit of teeth to it or maybe quite a bit of teeth depending on how it pans out in the high court that's a very different thing. And, 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 that, and that body is the only people who get to participate in it is based on their racial ancestry. So these are two different concepts. Recognition of Indigenous people, well, there's, you know, that's something that's been talked about for a while. There, uh, it would have been recognition in the preamble of the um, 1999 um, referendum on the Republic. Um, so there's that concept. And then there's this concept of the voice. It's been mashed together as this is how you get um, uh, recognition, recognition through this voice. And that's why, on the one hand, the Yes campaign is saying, this is just, you know, recognition of Indigenous people. This is just the right thing to do. This is long overdue. And then the No campaign saying, wait a second, there's this body based on race that's going to have all these rights. Um, that's because it's, the two concepts have been conflated, and I think they've been deliberately conflated. The... the, the 
the campaign methodology has been to try to appeal to people's goodwill. People want to do the right thing for Indigenous people. We know Indigenous people have had it tough over, over the years. Appeal to that goodwill to shoehorn in this, this advisory body with you know, the, these powers that we have no real idea how they're going to work. Um, and, and that's been the, 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 the plan. Well, it also comes with a, a few assumptions which it, it presents as being true instead of being discussed, which is that Aboriginal people are always at a disadvantage, people of colonial descent are always privileged, and that the only and that people of Australia are not listening to Aboriginal people, which is why they require a voice. And the other recent ad campaign I saw, which was truly disgusting, was where they used a young Aboriginal child and said they don't have a future essentially unless you pass this voice referendum. Now this is saying and making claims about Australia which simply aren't true. Now just before we go today, I think one of the most disturbing things that's happened in the last weeks of the campaign, it's only really just started, is this idea of pitting migrant Australians against people of colonial descent, saying, well, you're a new migrant, therefore you're not guilty of any of those sins that we're talking about. You're totally fine, so why don't you join with us and help Aboriginal people? And they're almost pitting them against the colonial descent people, which I think is an extraordinary way to tear Australia apart, especially as we are a nation of migrants. And in order to be a coherent society, we have to believe in the possibility of equality and for our government to be blind to race. Oh, I mean, this this is leftism through and through. You are guilty by the sins of your ancestors. So Australia is divided up into to, to, to the original um, inhabitants, the invaders and the people who came later, the, the, the neutral people. Um, the reality is no one alive today invaded anyone. No one alive today had their, 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 their land stolen. Um, the idea that you are, you know, if you're a new migrant, you have to associate yourself with one of these two camps is just tribalism and identity politics at its absolute disgraceful worst. Um, I do think, however, that a lot of migrants might be looking at this um, uh, you know, proposal and thinking, well, gee, if being here first gives you some sort of you know, special rights, what is that saying about me? Uh, you know, I came here, I'm a, I'm a new re recent migrant, I might have only been here a few years or a decade or I might be second generation or whatever. What does that say about me? So I, I don't think these appeals to the migrant community to sort of, you know, don't join the sort of white settler camp, join our camp, I don't think that will necessarily um, resonate that well. Um, a lot of people, um, recent arrivals from Australia, have come to countries where your your race and ancestry determine your political rights. That's often the reason they've left those sorts of countries. I think most migrants appreciate that in Australia everyone is treated equal, um, and that's one of the great blessings of this country, at least for now. Um, so, look, I think it'll be interesting, uh, the, the analysis after the event, um, which way the sort of migrant um, vote sort of splits on, on, on the voice. But I think the appeals to the migrant vote based on, you know, don't vote with the white man, vote with, with, with us, you know, noble Indigenous people, is just the most horrible identity politics. Yeah, once you start having a Prime Minister that ranks the value of Australian citizenship, I think we've got a problem. And I honestly believe that Albanese's camp should have had an official complaint to them against that, because that is against every fundamental principle that we believe in this country. But look, thank you for joining us. We're about to see which side Australia falls down on in this referendum. And uh, hopefully we vote for unity and hopefully we vote for a future that values democracy, the rights of the individual and equality. But thank you so much for joining us here today on Spectator TV. Thanks, Alexandra. Authorised by Scott Hardgraves, Institute of Public Affairs, Melbourne.